morning, everyone. My name's Emily, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. We have a fun service planned with a message from Brian Mills and worship led by our Hope students and Hope kids. I have a few announcements for you this morning, so please go ahead and find a seat while I tell you a bit about them. If you haven't had a chance to grab a tag off our giving tree in the lobby, there are still tags available for you to help provide needs for our local partners, Inner City Mission and The Outlet. Grab a tag, buy the listed supplies or gift cards, bring them back to Hope by December 24th, and put them in the baskets in the lobby. Thanks for your generosity in this season of giving. Our annual Inspire Conference is coming up on January 23rd here at Hope. Wherever God has placed you, He has placed you there to influence and lead others. This conference will help you find ways to be intentional in your leadership and influence at work, home, church, and more. Our special guest speaker is Mark Miller. Find out more about Mark and register to attend on our app under the Featured Events tab. Christmas is almost here. Our Christmas Eve services are happening on Saturday, December 23rd at 7 p.m. and Sunday, December 24th at 11 a.m., 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. We're planning for volunteers, coffee, photos, and all the things that make Christmas at Hope wonderful. And we need your help. Do you know which service you're planning to attend? Are you inviting family and friends to join you? Please take a second and hop onto our app to complete a quick poll. When you open the app, click on the tab that says, which services are you attending? The poll takes about 10 seconds and we appreciate your input. We're so grateful for everyone that joins our Hope community on Sunday mornings, but want to extend a special welcome to our first time visitors. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please stop by our treat and greet table in the side hallway after the service, where we would love to meet you and give you a special treat. If you're just now joining us, welcome. We're glad you're here. The service is about to start, so let's get ready to worship. It's almost Christmas. It's just days away. That means it's time for all the things that we love about this holiday. Gathering a family, final preparations, last minute shopping. Now, not to scare you, of course, because we would never do that. But then there's the music. Nonstop, 24 hours a day, streaming Christmas tunes. Don't let all this jingle bell rockin' get in the way of some of the stories that we find in these songs. The angels sing, the mountains reply, echoing their joyous strains, Gloria in Excelsis Deo, glory be to God on high. So there's a wide range from sugar plum fairies to all of heaven singing, but still there's nothing quite as compelling as God's love for you. Think about it just for a moment. Because most of what we call Christmas, it just ends on Christmas, okay? But God and His story, God and His love, God and His redemption, it goes on forever. It does not end, it's forever. So we echo out in joyous strains the greatest gift of all.
see some hands in the room. Hands up, come on. somebody in the room that you did not come to church with and just tell them, hey, you look good this morning. Merry Christmas. It's good to, come on, mean it now. Tell them they look good now. For those of you that know and for some of you that don't, um, I have the absolute honor and joy and privilege of being a part of NextGen uh, through Hope Students. And uh, what you may not know is that the entire team today is all Hope Students. Can we celebrate them in the room? Now, I also know that maybe some of you have come today to celebrate the Kids Wing. And can we just celebrate what's happening down in the Kids Wing with Mr. B and all your children? I also have the privilege of working here, and it's, it's really, um, it's been a life's joy. It's actually a dream come true, even though it's part-time. And um, we've been in so many meetings uh, just over the Christmas holiday, and one thing is echoed. And it wouldn't be what you might think it would be, like you gotta be perfect and everything has to be just right. But it's actually just been It's just offer our best. What is your best today? Hear these words.
Hi, Hope. This is Jerry Gibbs, and this is my granddaughter, Clarissa. Hey, everyone. There are so many things that we love about Christmas, and one of my favorite is trying to get all six granddaughters together in one place. And then this is my daughter. <laughs> and one of my favorite things is being with all my family together in one place. This Christmas season is truly special. And during this season of Advent, we reflect on the time of peace that Jesus brings. Luke 2.14 says, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace be with you. This Christmas, we pray that you experience the peace that only Jesus can bring. And today we hang the stocking of peace. Good morning, Hope. Man, it is so good to hear, be here with you and worship with you this morning in the middle of this Christmas season. And I don't know about you, but Christmas started kind of early this year in my house because I've got two littles, a five and a two and a half, and they're all about Christmas this year. And it's so much fun to relive Christmas through their eyes because I get caught up in the buying of the gifts and making sure everything is just perfect and the trees up and the decorations are up and the lights are on the house. I lose track of the beauty and the wonder of Christmas. It really started for us on December the 2nd. We went to a program at my daughter's school where they had a Santa, they had craft tables, and then they had a Christmas shop where you could give your kids just a few dollars to go buy gifts for people in your family. And they picked out grandma and grandpa, and they went out and they bought the gifts and they came back super excited, but already been sworn to secrecy that they couldn't tell anybody what was in those bags. And every morning they want to wake, know if they, when they wake up, can we give our gifts away yet? They're all about the giving of those gifts and those presents. That prompted my daughter, who's two and a half, to ask me this question, which is kind of out of the mouth of babes, right? She said, why do we give gifts? And all of a sudden, opportunity to talk about the reason why we truly celebrate Christmas. And the reason why we celebrate Christmas and we give gifts is because the greatest gift that was ever given to the world was given on that very first Christmas in the person, in the baby of Jesus Christ. And that's really why we come and gather. That's the reason why we celebrate with so much joy and anticipation in this season is about that Christ child. 
really that is at the core of what we are about here at Hope, is to share that hope of Christmas that was given in Jesus to the world. And when you give here and you partner with what God's doing here, you are a part of that story that's been told for thousands of years. And I want to pause and just thank you for your generosity and your giving in this last year that has allowed us to do so many amazing things to reach people that, uh, that need to be heard, that need, that need to hear the story of Jesus, but also the people that need to be uh, given to and experience the generosity of God and his people through his church. So we want to thank you. And so this morning, if you came prepared to give, you can give and partner with us in different ways. You can do it through our mobile app. You can do it through our uh, baskets or our, our, our stands in the back in the, auto, uh, in the lobby area. But you can also send a check the old-fashioned way in mail. I know it runs a little slow this time of year, but you can even attach it to a Christmas card if you want. But we just are really appreciative of your partnership and how you've stood beside us as, as we continue to reach people to hear about that great, great message. Let's, let's pray together this morning. God, I am so thankful that we get a chance to come in here and celebrate, to experience the joy that this season has, Lord. And I know that we're already excited because we see the kids coming in on the side aisles of the auditorium, Lord, that they also have great excitement and joy for this season as well, Lord. Help us to live uh, vicariously through them, to experience the joy of Christmas and to remember, Lord, how much joy filled our hearts when we encountered you and we have a relationship with you. God, help us to share that with others so they may also know you as we know you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, Rosie, what are you most excited about for Christmas? I think I'm most excited to see my family. What are you excited about for Christmas? Elf on the shelf. Elf on the shelf. Okay, that's exciting. Because she always brings us candy canes. Oh, okay. So she elf. Mm -hmm. okay. And she always also brings us stuff we don't need. Sawyer, what are you most excited about for Christmas? Singing. I'm very excited to spend time with my family, um, with my grandparents, and to be in the presence of God and remember that it's Jesus' birthday. Hey, what are you excited about for Christmas? Um, Santa. The hot chocolate. That's it? The hot chocolate? Yep. <laughs> um, okay. Cake? I love cake. Phone. A phone? You want a phone for Christmas? Seeing my family. Seeing your family? Okay. Um, <laughs> spending time with my family. Singing. Rose, what are you most excited about for Christmas? Um, Jesus. Aww. Anything else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what about presents? No. No? Okay. <laughs> you are. Are you excited to see anybody? No. Okay. okay. So it's all Jesus and nothing else. Candy. What kind of candy? Candy canes. Zion, what are you most excited about for Christmas? Trains. 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 The, the presents. Aww. Santa and presents. <laughs> Do you like the presents? Yeah. Making a big snowball. Ben, what are you excited about for Christmas? Coffee. Transformer. Transformers. Okay, who's your favorite Transformer? Um, Bumblebee. Seeing my family. Sugar cookies. Sugar cookies. Okay, you know exactly what you want. <laughs> to see the face on my brother whenever he opens up his first present. Oh.
Show me how to spin the light. Mm -hmm. Show me how to spin the light. Yeah. Cause all I have is what you gave. Watching seconds turn to days. I was made for more than just to watch it fly. A few more turns around the sun. Could be hundred, could be one. Show me how to spend the treasure of my time. Show me how to spend the life. Yeah. Show me how to spend the life. Whoa. Show me how to spend the life. Show me, show me, show me. It takes a lot to pull off something like that, but let's not forget the heroes today, the parents who got up early uh, with their kids and had them here early, <laughs> early and dressed, um, and uh, just, just a warning to those parents, uh, six weeks makes a habit out of something, so if you're here early for church in the future weeks, it could be a, a habit that sticks all next year. And that'll put you out of sync with the rest of the church. Hope is a 10 minutes late church, as, as many of you know. Uh, really, really grateful to be able to share that with our kids. We've been looking in this series uh, this month, we've been looking at frames, picture frames, and thinking about them like the different seasons of our life, but not just the seasons of our life, it's the expectations we have in those seasons. Because as you go through life, as you go through those seasons, often the expectations and the reality don't match up. And so you're faced with a decision. What do you do when the expectations in reality uh, can be so far apart sometimes? And uh, today we're actually going to be looking in Luke chapter 2 if you want to turn there. Uh, before we get there, I want to tell you about my grandma, my 98-year-old grandma. She died eight years ago, but um, over her uh, shoulder was always this collage of pictures that I didn't understand for the longest time. Now, let me tell you about my grandma real quick. She was a Rosie the Riveter type. Uh, she had a career before she had a husband, and uh, she never let him forget it. So, um, she actually would be, was, was a very stern lady, but also very gracious in, in, a, in a strange kind of mixture of things. And uh, she, we spent a lot of time with her and my granddad because uh, for, for a while there, my mom was a single mom. And so she actually kind of filled in and helped to support uh, my mom. And then even after my mom remarried, then, of course, our grandparents were still a very big part of our lives. We were over there before and after school every, every day. She was the kind of grandparent who could actually whip you and you knew it. So you needed to you needed to realize she wasn't just giving out candy. Um, she, she, was a, she was just a fine lady. But these pictures over her shoulder, I didn't really understand very much. She didn't talk about them. There were people in this collage of pictures that I didn't, I didn't know. Many I didn't know well, but they were family. See, my granddad had been married three times. His first marriage, uh, his wife died in childbirth. His second marriage uh, ended in divorce, but with three kids. And my mom was one of two kids in his third marriage. And so my grandma kept up with all of the people and all of the different branches of the family uh, through this collage of pictures. And so they were always changing. And even uh, portions of our family that lived in other states that I never saw or were through one of those other channels in my granddad's past, uh, my grandma always treated them like they were her family. And so even though they were part of my family, there were stories and there were secrets, some of the stories that I knew, and of course, the secrets I didn't until I was much older. But I think what was going on with these pictures is my grandma was using them as prayer prompts. Everybody on that wall, everybody who had a place in her family was her family, and she kept up with them in, in prayer as the different seasons presented different realities to my grandma and granddad, as it presented different realities to each person in the family. Those pictures kept changing and the story kept unfolding. Here's what I think we're going to see in Luke chapter 2 today that is important for those of us who are nearer the 98-year mark than we are the 18-year mark on the calendar is, uh, is that uh, the secret of life is really this. It's learning how to hold on to things and let go of things simultaneously while staying engaged. 
The secret of life, I think we're going to learn in Simeon and Anna's life in Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn there. In Luke chapter 2, we're learning about Simeon and Anna today, and the secret of life is really to learn what to hold on to and what to let go of simultaneously while staying engaged. And that can be a real challenge. In America, the forecast in 2034 is that 20% of our population will be in that generation, that season of life, closer to 98. I'm being very delicate because there are quite a few of you in the room who are closer there. I don't know what words to use. I'm also now part of that club, I think, as a grandparent of where I'm looking ahead uh, and behind in, in, in different, different ways. 20% of our population will be whatever that age is, and that's more than all of the kids combined in our country. For the first time in history, that pyramid of our social structure where you have more in the younger generation and fewer up top for obvious reasons, has been flipped over. And so we're actually beginning to enter a time where things have changed, and the economy is showing it. This $64 billion anti-aging economy that's out there, that doesn't include tech, that doesn't include health care, $64 billion anti-aging industry is projected to double just in the next 10 years. And Another secret of life is it's not going to work. I don't care what creams that you buy then where you have to put them and what, what kind of therapies you have to go through. What we all actually know to be true before we ever purchase these retail anti-aging things is we actually know the clock keeps ticking. The sands of time keep falling. How do we do what we're learning from Simeon and Anna today where we hold on and let go at the same time while staying engaged? Let's look at it. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Here's, uh, here's, what, um, here's what Luke says. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. Let me tell you what this word devout means because it's going to carry us through the whole story. It doesn't just mean he was a believer. It, it means that he was aggressively laying hold of something. To, to use this word in, in its original language would have been to aggressively lay hold of something, to clutch it. it it's kind of like the way I'll do a, a Culver's double cheeseburger with bacon, you know, the deluxe. Like, I'm going to clutch that like my life depends on it. I treasure that thing. But it's not just laying hold of something. This word for devout means to lay hold of something that's good. And that's a relative term. We all have different ways of defining and measuring what is good. Simeon had figured out what is good, and he was aggressively laying hold of it. That's what the word devout means. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. This word for waiting is not a passive word. It's not like uh, waiting your turn in line patiently at a theme park. It's more like the way I wait for that cheeseburger at Culver's, where I'm pushing up to the person in front of me. I don't know why people don't understand where they're supposed to be in the drive through line. You're supposed to be right on the bumper in front of you, and the minute somebody rolls, everybody ought to roll at the same distance, and I'm so eager to move ahead that I'm very actively involved in the waiting. I'm pressing forward. That's the way he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. And I'm not going to tell you what the consolation of Israel is just yet. We'll get to it in just a second. We'll come back to that. The Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, kind of a child dedication, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Notice that he has seen something so magnificent he's ready to die. You can take me now, Lord. This is all I needed. This is what I've been waiting for. Now my life is complete. And that's actually what the word peace means. Hold your hand up like this and turn to your neighbor and say, peace out, peace to you, peace, brother. This, this word for peace is literally a common Jewish farewell. This is the way they would have walked out of the room. Peace out. See you later. And it was not just a picture of an emotion that they wanted somebody to have when they left the room. It was a picture of total layered peace, a practical and arranged peace. It, it, it was a peace that, that, that they wanted for you emotionally, that you would have peace with God, uh, peace spiritually, a peace with yourself psychologically, that you would be at peace with who you are. 
that it would be peace with other people, that you would have peace not only with your friends, but also you would have figured out a way to have peace with your enemies, that it would be a national peace. It wasn't just an individual personal thing or a communal thing, but it was actually a national thing where there was, there was peace that was shared. And even more, this word also meant peace with your environment. It was actually peace with the natural world altogether. And so this word peace represents such a layered, stacked, complete peace that you have now in, in, integrated all of the different parts of who you are, that you have congruence between those parts, those parts of your life, those different relationships, those different parts of your identity are not competing with each other. There's no more tug of war, but you are literally at peace. And so this common farewell as you walked out of a room was a way of wishing on people a total and complete peace, health, wealth, prosperity, and just, just integrity as a person. What in the world would make Simeon think that he had seen that peace in this little baby who's just coming for a child dedication like a lot of other babies? Well, the word consolation is a strange word. We hear it as some kind of emotional um, satisfaction or relief or comfort. Uh, the word is actually used for when you call your lawyer. Better call Saul. When you are when you are, you get one phone call, you have been arrested, you are being called into court, you got one person you can call. Not all of us are going to call family because some of our family wouldn't answer. <laughs> but you might call your lawyer. That one you want to stand with you as an advocate. Not just a buddy, not just a presence, not just a comforting side-by-side -side kind of a presence, but somebody who actually knows what to do in that moment. Somebody who knows what to say and how to handle the situation. That's the consolation. That's the word for consolation. In Jesus, in this baby, somehow Simeon saw something that was more than just an emotional uh, relief or salve, but actually there was some kind of a serious hope and help that he thought he was seeing. Why would he jump to all that? We have to turn back 700 years to Isaiah. Many scholars believe that this is what it's referring to in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 starts this way, Comfort, comfort for my people, says your God. This word for comfort and that word for consolation are very similar and close. Now, Isaiah is not just writing to pat people on the back. In fact, he spent the last 39 chapters saying some pretty ugly, rough things. He's promising God's people about 150 years before they experience it. He's promising God's people that they're about to be judged and punished and disciplined, and it's going to be terrible. He spends 39 chapters telling them why. He's indicting them for their idolatry. He's indicting them for their immorality, for their injustice. He's talking about all of the ways they don't line up with God's ways and how they have actually rebelled against God and caused His name to be defamed among the nations. That's what Isaiah has spent 39 chapters doing. In chapter 39, the Babylonians actually start to move in that direction. And in chapter 40, Isaiah is saying, but hold on, it's not going to be all bad. He says, comfort, comfort. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Isaiah 40 is a promise that that judgment and discipline, those terrible things are not going to last forever. When Simeon, 700 years later, sees Jesus, that's what he's understanding. This is not just a baby. This is not just a sweet story. But all of the stuff we've been waiting for our whole lives, the stuff he waited for his whole life, the, 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 the stuff that the generations before him had passed down that they were waiting for as a culture and nationally, the stuff they had been waiting for that God promised, he's saying, it's here. This is the consolation of Israel. And so he's like, now I can die. My life's complete. Everything's been done. Anna next has a different reaction. Let's read what happens with Anna. Luke chapter 2, verse 36. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. This is a strange detail, but whenever you see where somebody is from, you need to go back and look at where they're from because usually there's a bigger story being told. And in Anna's life, it's very possible there are some secrets. Why in the world are we being told where she's from? The tribe of Asher is the far north end, northwest part of the Holy Land at that time. And in that region was a city called Tyre, T-Y-R-E. If you go back in the Old Testament and look at Tyre and look at that uh, region, there's a lot of demonic activity happening there. And in fact, in Tyre, the city of Tyre is actually uh, referred to in other Old Testament passages as the great serpent, Satan himself. 
So there's something weird. Why in the world would you want to include that she's from the tribe of Tyre, this far away and troubled tribe? Why does it matter that she is from that tribe and here she is now serving in the temple? It, 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 it's a strange little detail. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She had spent most of her life as a single woman, not married. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Now, this word for worship isn't, uh, isn't uh, just a word for singing. It's not just a simple for, again, emotional presence. There were other words that Luke could have used to describe Anna's worship. He used a very specific word, the word latruo. It comes from the word latris, and a latris was a person. A doulos was a slave, didn't get any money. A freeman was an eleutheroi. They, they were free, and they got to do whatever they want, and they could make money doing whatever they want. But a latris was the lowest paid employee, a minimum wage person doing the job you can't get anybody else to do. So you're not quite a slave, but you're also not an eleutheroi. You're not a free person. She was a latris. There's a good case to be made for the fact that she's not just in the temple singing songs, but she's doing this because she's a widow, and it's the only way she can make ends meet. She's there serving the temple and the sacrifices and the ceremony, doing a job because this is how she can actually put food on the table. But notice her response to uh, what, what uh, she's seeing in Jesus. Verse 38, coming up to them, the family, Mary and Joseph and Jesus, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. You know, I love it that Simeon, his response is, okay, I can die now. I can go in peace. And her response is to talk to everybody she could find. This is what's going to happen when my wife and I die. I'm going to be like, thank God, I'm at relief and I'm resting. She's going to be, but there's more people to talk to. And she's just going to want to keep, keep going and share. And that was Anna's response. She's not, just giving, uh, she's not just saying thank you and boy, this is nice and now I have relief. She actually wants to tell people what she has seen that the redemption for Jerusalem is finally here. Now, if you look back at Simeon, he wasn't just trying to escape or something. Notice what he sees in Jesus, that he's a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. Here's what we see in both Simeon and Anna that I think we can take for ourselves today. They both were not just taking Jesus as a gift to them personally, but a gift to be shared. They saw that this child was not just a personal gift for the ways that they needed encouragement and to feel different. And Simeon saw him as a light for the Gentiles, and Anna couldn't stop herself from telling everybody she met, redemption is here. Jesus is not just a gift for you, it's a gift to be shared. And what better figures to do that than Simeon and Anna? This is not a common Christmas story. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about them, but here's why I want to do that, because I think they model for us how to let go and how to hold on simultaneously while staying engaged. And that's the secret of life. Just a one-point sermon today. You're welcome. This is the one point, but it does have three subpoints. You knew there was a trick. Okay. Letting go. The secret of life is about learning how to let go. When you get to be in that season of life, in that age, you have to get there with the skill of letting go and letting go of the right things, two big things. One of the things that we struggle to let go of are, is all the grief that we've been through, all the loss. I remember watching uh, my, my own grandparents. I remember leading Bible studies of, of retired people, widows and widowers. And what, what they all said in common is that they were tired of losing their friends, tired of losing their family. There's been so much loss of, of personal loss. But it's not just personal loss. They were watching the ways that the world was changing. And when you've gone about a certain project in your life thinking that God called you to do this, when you've been pretty sure you're doing it better than your parents and the generation before you and that you and all your buddies were going to fix the world, you begin to watch things change and you, you feel a sense of loss, like the ways that things used to be, the nostalgia, the ways that we, the good old days, that goes on for all of us and that gets hard to let go of because of all the loss. And if you can't let go of all the loss that comes with being human in the real world, you end up at the end of your life under a mountain of it. If you don't know how to grieve it, how to properly process it with God, then it can actually give you a hard heart. 
None of us want to end up there, but that means you have to have the skill of knowing what to let go of and how to let it go. But the other pressure that we find uh, that, that, that creates that hard heart is many of us think we have to fix the world in our own lifetime. We think it's actually up to us. We've got to reach the promised land in our lifetime. We don't see ourselves as part of a, a long multi-generational project. We see ourselves as the clock's ticking. i got some urgency and pressure. i got to get these big things done right now. And if I don't see the promised land myself, then I haven't done enough with my life. And that kind of pressure with that kind of loss, that kind of urgency with that kind of loss can actually give you a hard heart. What ends up happening is we develop a false self under that pressure. Remember, we've been talking about the false self through this series uh, one definition of the false self is it, it is how you see yourself apart from God. When you take God out of the picture of your life, when you take God out of the picture of your circumstances, when you take God out of the picture of the things that you're working on day in, day out, when you take him out of that, the way you see yourself is your false self. And many of us live like, even faithful believers in God, we live like God's not involved in that with us. We live like God's not going to continue on the work after we're gone. We live like it's up to us to do it all right now. And if we can't get it fixed, if we can't get it just right in the ways that we want it, we end up with, with hard hearts at the end. The only way not to have a hard heart in that final season of life is you have to learn how to let things go. The more you try the false self, the more you try to fix that false self and that, that individual pressure and burden that you feel, the more you become your false self. One of the things we have to learn is how to see God's help and receive God's help. I want to show you an actual photograph of one of the first angels. I'm confident this was a real life angel. This is a photograph of a real life angel in my own life. I don't know his name, and he probably wasn't really an angel. He didn't smell like one anyway. If, uh, if, uh, if, if, he's a, if he was an angel, angels stink. We had both just been on a 100-mile bike ride. Every September in Springfield, there's a century ride, the second Sunday of the year, and it was one of my bucket list things to ride a century ride at some point in my life. And uh, so I was the kind of rider that I'm basically just a hobbyist, which meant I couldn't keep up with the lead pack. But I trained pretty hard, and I was kind of a perfectionist, so I was ahead of the back of the pack, but that meant I was all by myself in the middle. And for about 60 miles, that was okay. The first three-fifths of that ride, I did all right because I had trained hard. But in that fourth set of 20 miles, I bonked. And if you don't know what bonking is, go look it up. If you're riding, uh, if you're riding at that, that much, uh, all the calories are gone, but the race isn't. <laughs> you still got miles to go. I bonked, and I was out of energy, and I was down near Pawnee looking at a power plant and feeling all the wind. And I'm like, I'm lost. I'm in hell somewhere. This is, must be what it's like. It's windy. And I, and I started to lose it. And then suddenly, this cyclist comes out of nowhere. And it kind of aggravated me at first because I'm like, what's this guy doing? Can I trust him? Is he going to kill me? I was looking for signs like, was he packing a knife? Was he trying to run me off in the ditch? Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm delirious at this point. Not, nothing's making sense. And he actually stayed with me even though he's a better rider than me. After that fourth set of 20 miles, he goes on, he finishes the race. I'm in a more familiar territory, and I'm feeling the end of the race, so I finished just fine. And, but then when we got to the place where we were carbon up and refueling, I was like, oh my gosh, look, that's the guy who was with me. And I went over to thank him because I was quite sure I would not have finished the race if it wasn't for him. When we see ourselves as having to do it all on our own, no matter what headwinds are facing us, no matter what we're experiencing, if you believe your job is just to grit your teeth and pedal faster, you are likely to reinforce your false self. And in that final season of life, you will not only be alone, you may be, uh, have a hard heart in the process. And you will continue to see yourself as living life apart from God. we got to learn how to let go of that individual pressure and urgency to do it all in our own life and see that God's doing something bigger than us. But you can't let go of everything and just wave the white flag. You also got to hold on to some things. What I love about Simeon is that he was devout. He was holding on to the right things. He had figured out what was good, and he wasn't going to let it go. He had his claws dug into it. He, was, he, he knew what really mattered. He was able to let go of some small things. He was able to let go of some big things, but big things that are out of his control. But he held on to the things that really mattered most. And in the end of his life, in this final season, he's actually in the temple. And so when he sees Jesus, he gets it. He goes, this is it. Now think about all the things he's having to hold on to. He can't hold on to his politics because he watched the politics change in his own life. And he saw generationally how the politics changed. 
He couldn't hang on to his own form of religious expression in worship because that had changed a lot over the generations and even in his own life. He couldn't hang on to where the national boundaries were. He couldn't hang on to how the economy was. He couldn't even hang on to, uh, to, uh, to all of the things that he was most committed to. What he had to hold on to was the promise of God. It was actually God's promise throughout time, God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love in the form of Jesus Christ. That's what he held on to. And so when he saw Jesus, that was comforting to him because he didn't need all the things to make his life complete. He didn't need all the things to help him to have peace. What gave him peace was that Jesus was going to bring all that. And so he says, my life is complete. His, his faith in God, his relationship with God was well-established and connected. His relationship with others could be well-established and connected. His relationship with the world around him, his relationship with his own nation, his, his relationship with himself, he found perfect congruence and his life was complete because of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've seen the show Blue Zones or you've heard about Blue Zones. Anybody know Blue Zones? This is fascinating. It's not, it's not a Christian study, but there were some sociologists and some scientists who were trying to figure out why some people in some parts of the world live to 100 while the rest of us don't. And they live at, at, to 100 years old in a higher concentration in four geographic areas around the planet. They went to all these places. They studied and asked uh, in the community, but also with those people who are 100 years old. And they figured out that if you are really stressed out in a drive through line at Culver's because you need another cheeseburger, that's not a success formula for turning 100. Turns out. Diet and exercise do matter, but here's what actually matters more. Diet, exercise, and environment are part of the equation. They found nine traits that actually help people get to be 100. Do you know what four of them were? Purpose. Faith. Family friends, that it, these people in these places around the world had such meaningful relationships with people around them. They had kind of a tribe. They had people who were checking in on them. They had people who needed them. They weren't just there soaking it all up, but they were actually contributing to the relationships. They were telling stories. It was intergenerational people hanging out in living rooms and around tables. Food and diet matter, but not nearly as much as purpose, faith, friends, and family. And that's biblical. I think that's what Simeon and Anna had experienced. They held on to the right things. And so when they got into that season of life, there were a lot of things they had to let go of, but they knew what mattered most. And they were prepared to share that with every young person around them. That's a picture of the life we're all looking for. But it doesn't happen if you don't stay engaged. We're trying to let go. We're trying to hold on. But we also have to stay engaged. Uh, th this is a picture of my grandma. Uh, 2015-ish, uh, the year that she died. Uh, we're together in her retirement home, and uh, my son and daughter are there with us, but also my daughter-in-law, who at the time uh, was just a girlfriend, though we did tell my son if he screwed it up, we were keeping her. Um, my grandma agreed. She gave her vote that Morgan was great. So uh, this is what would happen when we would go uh, home to visit, and we would always spend a couple hours with my grandma. We had to drive out of our way, but we always did it because uh, of what she did for me when I was younger, but also she had great wisdom to share. And she would have a list called it Esther's Etiquette. There were rules. There were things that she needed to pass on to the younger generation. It, here, here's some of it. If you're talking to an old person, speak up. I'm only 50, but I'm telling you, the worst place in the world is a crowded, loud restaurant. I can't hear anymore. I don't know what's happening, but uh, she's like, you, you guys mumble. Stop mumbling. And she wanted my teenage kids to know that. You, this, was, this was wonderful holiday time. Uh, she also said, don't talk about technology. Don't know about technology. Don't care about technology. Don't want to know about your stupid phone. Like, she's, she's just being very insistent. Don't talk about technology because you're excluding me. I don't, I don't do anything with technology. She said, don't talk about pop culture. Pop culture is a wasted reference. She's not watching any movies or listening to that kind of music. She still wants to listen to Lawrence Welk and Hee Haw. You know, my kids are like, what's that? I'm like, you don't want to know. Those are, those are family secrets. We keep those buried. <laughs> she had these things like, if you talk about these things, you're going to exclude an old person. And she just wanted them to know. Of course, she had to complain about the food because that, the food is always terrible. It never could be what she made. But here's, here's the thing. My grandma also had wisdom to share. There was a good perspective on life that she had figured out over time. She knew what to hold on to. She knew what to let go of. But she also decided to stay engaged. She took this brief time where there wasn't much time, and she had the conversation. 
we took the time to sit with her and have these conversations and to listen. Now, my grandma wasn't able to let go of just everything. She was still quite concerned that women were wearing britches. So she would be a little unnerved by that. She wouldn't have been about any of this music today. She would have loved your kids. She probably would have said, you know, they're kind of wild. You need to spank them. But uh, she, would have at least, she would have at least said, you know, hey, the music's great, uh, but just not those instruments and not in worship. She, she didn't believe that kind of stuff belonged. But she was able to hold on to the right things. She knew what was good. She knew what was godly. She wasn't afraid to talk about sin and repentance. She was praying for, for heaven and restoration and redemption and constellation, or co- consolation for the people that she loved. We all have to find a way to do that in the course of our life. How are we going to let go of certain things? How are we going to hold on to certain things? And how do we stay engaged? Listen, um, I think... It would be good for those of us who are not close to 98, maybe to turn off the screen, put down the phone, and go visit with some of these dear saints in our lives. These people have been, they've lived through some stuff. My grandma was born in 1917. She saw a few things, and she lived through it, and at the end of her life, she did not have a hard heart. She still had her faith, and if you're closer to 98, let me tell you, we don't need you to be good at technology, frankly. We've got a lot of people we can ask about that but we need wisdom. Our culture is starving for wisdom. We have all the information and all the technical tools we can find, but we need to remember what is good. If you as an older person in this latter season of your life can remember what is good and to share it with us, that's good for us. And the legacy you really need to leave behind is that, the legacy of God's grace, the legacy of His truth, the legacy of His steadfast love. You've watched it over generations. Share with us your confidence. Share with us uh, your, your peace that you have from God. We all are still trying to work through our projects and shape our identities and find congruence and integrity between our pieces. If you know what that is in Christ, if you found that in Him, share it with us before you peace out. One thing, back to Isaiah 40. There was a piece in Isaiah 40 I didn't read that I want to read here at the end of Isaiah 40, where Isaiah is giving this comfort to uh, God's people for the next 700 years. At the end, verse 28, you'll, you'll recognize this. It's not going to be on the screens. I just want you to listen to it. Isaiah says this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even the youths, they grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's probably a common scripture that you've heard or you've seen on a picture somewhere. Maybe you've seen a little knick-knack on your grandparents' shelf that's got an eagle in Isaiah 40. This is what it's referring to. In Isaiah, when he's facing a historic difficult time and generations of trouble, he remembers that God lifts up those who are tired and weak. And he puts that in front of God's people for generations. And when Simeon sees Jesus... Even in his old age, even watching all of the disappointments by the Roman Empire around him in Jerusalem, even listening to and being so exhausted by all of the political debates going on, even looking at the things he was leaving unfinished, even looking at the things that he never got to experience or do, even having to live with his own mistakes, what he received in the end when he saw Jesus is inspiration. My life is complete, like a wing, like like an eagle soaring on the air. Listen, that is the message that young people today need to hear. That's the message that older people need to remember. If you can learn how to let go and hold on and stay engaged, you still have something to give that's way bigger than you. If you received communion when you walked in, would you please prepare for this meal? This is why we share this meal the way that we do. These are not just tokens or symbols. We're tying ourselves into that same eagle message, to that same eagle scripture and image. 
we're, we're choosing to be on the path of Simeon and Anna. Was, as we're watching all the things around us continue to change at an ever rapid rate, as we look ahead and we get afraid for financial security, as we fear for the mounting grief and loss, as we look ahead and we're, we're worried if we're going to have increased isolation at the end of our life, am I going to end up all alone? Is anybody going to come visit me? Am I going to be able to, be, to share meaningful moments with people? Whatever fears we have looking forward, this is not just a token. We're able to say, hey, my life is complete. I have peace in Jesus. And that's not a personal thing. That's a shared thing. I love it that Simeon and Anna both saw this as something for others. When we eat this, it's not just about what we need. It's about what the world needs. The reason they're so loud, the reason they're fighting so hard, it's because they're forgetting that it's Jesus who brings the peace. We eat this bread remembering his body that was broken for us. We drink this juice remembering it was his blood that was spilled for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, forgive us when we allow ourselves to get cynical. Forgive us when we worship the idol of self. Forgive us when we live like you're not helping, like it's all up to us. Forgive us when we put more trust in others than we put in you. Father, help us to see what is good in your spirit, in your character, in your son, in your word. Help us to hold on to those things and to let everything else go. Lord, thank you for the gift of long life. May we steward it well. In Jesus' name, amen. song with us today.
We are so glad you're here to join us this weekend. We want to invite you back next weekend. Christmas Eve is coming, and this year we have four services for you to choose from. We have Saturday night at 7 o'clock here, of course, in the auditorium, and then three services on Sunday at 11, 1, and 3. And these are new services for us. We've never done this lineup of services before, and we're trying to do our best to make sure that we're prepared for you and your friends that are coming with you. If you wouldn't mind join, going on our app or our website and filling out a survey, letting us know what service you're going to be at, that will help us be prepared for you and your friends that you're bringing with you for Christmas Eve. So we hope to see you back here all for Christmas Eve services next weekend. Also, as I'm looking across the room, I'm seeing lots of new faces. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, we would love to get an opportunity to get, introduce ourselves to you. There's a treat and greet area right through those double doors in the back hallway here. We'd love to give you a, a freshly made cookie, Christmas cookie, and introduce ourselves, answer any questions about the church you might have. PJ and I will be out there after service. Other than that, guys, see you, guys after, uh, see you next weekend. Have a great, great Christmas season.